before, right before I got up in the, into the pulpit. I know the enemy does not want you to hear this tonight. This is a word that I have, I told Dr. B before church, I can't get away from it. I've been preaching it every place I go. And I've got several messages in this binder, but I can't get away from this one. And so I want you to turn to Mark 16 and then also bookmark Romans 12. <clears throat> you really need them both. This is probably, this will be one of the most powerful things that you ever hear. It's going to be a great time tonight. I'm excited. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray over you as you turn there. You don't have to, I'm just going to pray over you as you turn to this, this word. Father, I thank you for, I thank you for the giving of the people. I thank you for uh, Compass Club. I thank you that you are reaching a generation with this material. And I thank you for this word tonight that it's going to go forth like seed. And so I pray for the hearts and the minds of the people under the sound of my voice in this room and watching by live stream. Lord, I ask right now that this seed would not fall upon a hardened heart or deafened ears, but that it would pierce the heart, rightly divide soul and spirit as you said your word does. I thank you that your word is quick and powerful. Let us leave tonight transformed in your presence. You are the guest of honor tonight, Jesus. It's all about you tonight, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Let the church say praise the Lord. Read with me in Mark 16, beginning in verse 14. I call this the Great Commission 2.0. The reason I call it 2.0 is because you know the one from the end of the book of Matthew. That's the one that everyone quotes. But this is another, um, this is still the Great Commission, but this is how, this is just how Mark uh, wrote this down, and it's very powerful. Later, he appeared to the 11 disciples themselves. I'm, I'm from the NASB translation, by the way. He appeared to the 11 disciples themselves as they were reclining at the table, <clears throat> and he reprimanded them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen from the dead. Notice here that Jesus had to give a rebuke before he gave a revelation because it's important that we're emptied of our hardness so that we can receive the truth of revelation. And so he first comes with rebuke. He never rebukes to, to scold you. He rebukes to prepare you. And so he, he begins with a rebuke for unbelief because unbelief is the greatest hindrance to any miracle in this room tonight. And you'll see in just a minute why he rebuked unbelief specifically. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The one who has believed and has been baptized will be saved. Somebody say will. But he who has not believed will be condemned. These signs will, somebody say will, accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink the deadly poison, it will not harm them. Stop right there. I'm not a snake handler. People ask me because I'm from West Virginia, and I'm, uh, it, I grew up PHC, Pentecostal Holiness, and every time I say it, they go, did you handle snakes? In fact, the first time I met Pastor Tommy Bates at the main event last year, he said, where are you from? I said, West Virginia. And he said, oh, great, Appalachia. He said, what, the, um, you know, what, what was your upbringing? I said, Pentecostal Holiness. And he went, hmm. Did you handle snakes? <laughs> no, sir, I did not. And that is not what this means. What that means is you will be able to handle the schemes of the enemy in your culture, and the schemes of the enemy will not affect you. You will affect the enemy in your culture. That's what that means. So, and that's, that's, I think that's the biggest reason that many people won't read this commission is because they can't explain the handling of the serpents. And we do have some snake handling churches in Appalachia, by the way. They, they did a whole documentary about a church about an hour from me. It wasn't mine, by the way. <laughs> Had to make that very clear. We do not handle snakes. And if they drink the deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will, somebody say will, yeah. lay hands on the sick. And notice that they won't just lay hands on the sick. It said the sick will recover. This is more powerful than you're letting on tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So then when, Je when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And they went and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. Notice here that when the word of the Lord is preached, the spirit of the Lord will often confirm the preaching of the word with signs and wonders and miracles, salvation, healing, baptism of the Holy Ghost. These are things that, these are things that confirm that the word of the Lord is being preached. Are you here with me tonight? Notice that Jesus did not say that these things could happen. He didn't say that these things should happen. He didn't even say that these things might possibly happen. He said these things will 
happen. He, did, he didn't leave any room for debate. I'm not sure where we got to this place in the American church system where we can debate if miracles are still happening and if speaking in tongues is still appropriate. Jesus left no room for debate. He said, they will speak in tongues. You will cast out devils, which is why it bothers me that many people who are blood-bought, spirit-filled, love the Lord are so scared of the demonic. They're so scared of speaking in tongues. They are scared of the things of the supernatural. Could I just say to you, he didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a he gave you power, love, and a sound mind. If you are fearful of the supernatural, it's not from God. It might be from a faulty doctrine, but it's not from my Jesus. He left no room for debate with us. He said, if you believe in me, these things will come out of you. They, not that you, and you, you don't need to follow after the stuff. You follow him, and these things follow after you. That's the order. Jesus, you, these things, we don't chase after these things. They just happen as we preach. I don't know how many times that these things have happened in our public school meetings. I don't ask for them. This is probably why I get in trouble when I preach in schools and it makes the news. I don't ask for this stuff. Kids leave speaking in tongues that were Baptists when they walked in. And I don't, I don't pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost in schools because there's so many different denominations. I, I preach a very point blank salvation message and it just happens. We've had kids, we've had kids with scars from cutting and their scars disappear in our meetings. I mean, in the auditorium of their school, guys. Why? Because Jesus always confirms the preaching of the word with signs, wonders, and miracles with people who believe. Is there anybody in the room who believes? We need to get this out of the way right now because I want to say this should be a night of miracles. It should be a night of breakthrough. It should be, it should be a night of miraculous, but there's got to be a hunger in the room. There's got to be a faith for the supernatural in the room. Or did you just come to hear a loud young preacher. I hope not. I don't have anything to give to you. I don't have anything to give to you except what he's given to me. It's the same thing they said in the book of Acts. And if you want to, if you want to have a historical record of did these things actually happen, go read the book of Acts. That's where it had, that's the historical record of where all the miracles took place. You know, I can show you the day, the hour, what time it was, who was there when the Holy Spirit fell. And none of these self-proclaimed theologians can tell me anything about when the Holy Spirit left. Oh, it's quiet in the room. I said, I can tell you what time it was. I can tell you what month it was. I can tell you who was there and I can tell you who was invited and didn't show up when the Holy Spirit fell upon us. And I can't find one verse and neither can you about the day that he was taken from us. You know why? Because he wasn't. He's still here. There's still healing. There's still signs of wonders. Blind eyes still open. Deaf ears still come unplugged. The lame still get up and walk. I still speak with tongues. It's the nature of the Holy Ghost. We're starting fast tonight. It could be said that, <laughs> it could be said that these final words of Jesus before his ascension set the standard for a normal Christian. Think about that. Notice he didn't give this word to evangelists, preachers, teachers, apostles, prophets. He gave it to believers. He gave it to you. He gave it to you. He gave it to you. He said, those who believe in me will do these things. And he left no margin for debate. The word will there, and, and we use the word will quite often, and we can use it for the will of God. We can use it for will you do this for me. But the, the word will, it, by definition, can, mean, can also mean this, denoting the inevitable thing ha about to happen. When you say, if you do this, this will happen, there's no room for debate. It's going to happen. When you flip the light switch, do the lights have a debate with you about whether they're going to turn on? They will turn on. You see, the word will lets us know it's a guarantee. If you receive this, this is the, if you receive that as the input, the output is this. And it's that every time. He's very consistent. I'm preaching better than you're letting on right now. I haven't got to the word yet. I'm just laying a foundation for you. You got this for free. Tonight, I'm going to preach to you on this subject. Make Jesus normal again. Make Jesus normal again. It could be said that Jesus in these words is setting the standard for a normal Christian. 
this is a word that I believe we use so often and we, we overuse it kind of like the word love. And we say that, you know, we say words we don't really even know what they mean. And we say we love something that we really just kind of like. We overuse words a lot. And this is one of those words that I think we overuse. And I don't know if any of you have ever looked up the definition of the word normal. But we're going to talk about what, nor what does it mean to be normal? You know, I've heard for the last three years because of the COVID pandemic, I've heard many people say, man, I really would like things to get back to. And then I've heard some researchers say that our normal is totally rewritten. It'll never be the same again. How many of you have heard people say that? How many of you heard people in the last three years say, I would love for things to get back to normal? Have you heard that said? Everybody, how many of you have said, I wanted to get back to normal? And so we, we've talked about this in regards to COVID, but I don't know if you really know what the word normal means. And so I'm gonna give you the definition. When I looked it up, because you think you know what it means, it just means a stand, you know, the standard, the um, the expectation. You could say this is just the this is just what you expect. But normal actually means this. So the question we're going into tonight is: What is normal? What does it mean to be normal? And is there such a thing as biblically normal? What does it mean to be biblically normal? Is there anybody that wants to leave tonight biblically normal? God, I hope so. I thank you, all five of you that want to be biblically normal. I guess you just want to come to church. We're going to have fun tonight, Pearson. <laughs> Pearson's a young preacher I'm mentoring. You'll, you'll hear his story in a little while. He's, he's down here going, yeah, yeah. He gets excited. Don't mind him. He's just being biblically normal. <laughs> normal is an adjective that means this, to conform to a set of standards or rules. In other words, to be normal, you must fit a certain standard. You must, you must check all the boxes. You must meet a certain quota. That is, somebody say normal. normal. It means to conform. Somebody say conform. You'll need this later. I'm going to close the message. We're going to come back to this, but you need to hear that. Normal means to conform to a set of standards or rules. For example, for a basketball to be considered normal, for a men's basketball to be normal, it has to be a certain size. You, there's a men's basketball and a women's basketball. And if, you go, if, you're, if you're familiar with the game of basketball, you can go into a gym and pick up a ball and know this is not the right size. Right? You, you just know. You, you just know by feeling it. You know by observing it. You know by bouncing it. This isn't normal. It, um, for, a, for a basketball to be normal, it has to be inflated to a certain, to a certain extent. Uh, so many pounds, and, and it has to bounce a certain height. You can overinflate it. You can underinflate it. But how many of you know, how many of you would know if you grabbed a basketball and started bouncing it and tested the size, you would know if it's normal or not. If you've played it before, if you've been around it, you know what's normal and what's not. Uh, so, sometimes cultural norms... Um, norms are things that you don't even think about because the masses are doing it. In our culture, if it's normal, everybody's doing it, and that's how they get you to do it. I'm having, I'm having more fun than you are. If it's normal, that means the over, not just the majority, like not 51%, more like 98% of people are doing this. Like, it's normal to brush your teeth at night. I hope that's normal for all of you. It's normal to wear clothes in public. Please keep that normal. Can we agree that's normal? Now, I'm going to say something to you. I want you to tell me if this is normal. For a church service to be considered normal in America, it usually needs to have some sort of opening, usually by a deacon or a youth pastor, three to five songs. Five's a little, that's, that's cutting it. Um, you're pushing it there. And then someone comes up and gives an offering, and sometimes they'll give a devotional for the offering. And then there's a sermon that lasts somewhere between 28 to 40 minutes. Not here, never. Um, I'm a son of the house, so it'll be okay. I do that as well. And then there's some sort of dismissal prayer or altar call. Would you call that a normal church service? If, however, the worship extends beyond the 30-minute cookie-cutted time slot, and there's more than five songs, bless your heart, Braden. If there's more than five songs and, and Dr. B doesn't get to preach, would you call that like, and, and it's so odd. When that happens, we always say, we always used to say, man, the Lord really showed up tonight. So I guess he doesn't show up when we preach. You know, when that happens. <laughs> but how many of you say that? Like, if the, if the worship overtakes everything else, we just say the Lord showed up. 
and I guess the Lord can only show up like once a month or something. You know, and if, and if, if someone preaches, well, he just ain't coming. <laughs> That's how, am I telling the truth? That's what we in America say is normal. And a normal church service in our mind has to have those elements to it. That's considered normal. Would you agree? If you're with me, say yes. In our culture, it is normal for a revival, I say that very loosely, to last two to three nights, and then we have to get back to the program. Revivals are usually louder than the other church services. It's, a, it's usually a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we've got to get, and, and usually you do it a spring revival and a fall revival. Am I really hitting y'all's grow, um, childhood norms or what? Anybody grow up in church, you had a spring revival and a fall revival, and it was Friday through Sunday, and, some, and, and all it was was, it, it was, these were great services. They were just louder than the normal services. And then, but then, how many of you know the next Sunday you went back to the norm? To the, you got to go back to what used to be. And so in our culture, that's, it's normal for revival to not change you. You better hear this preacher. I said, in America, it is normal for revival to not change you, but only to consume your weekend. Hmm. Anything outside of these norms, you would call abnormal, meaning not normal. It doesn't check the boxes. It doesn't meet the quota. It doesn't fit the standard. And if it doesn't fit the standard, it's abnormal. And when something is abnormal, it's generally not accepted by the, by the normal people. <laughs> and then the abnormal people end up on the news. <laughs> Pay attention. Or if you're still here, say amen. Yeah. If normal means that you have to meet a set of rules, then the next question you have to ask is, who made those rules? Rules don't just appear. The laws of scientific life, the laws of our bodies, God wrote those rules. Would you agree? So the, there's no law of life that just appeared. God decided this is the rule for this, and this is how this goes, and there are boys and there are girls, and girls can't become boys. Of, oh, I'm sorry. It's the wrong month for that. Um, and, and boys can't become girls. That's a, that is a biblical, that's called normal. Who decided that? Well, God decided that. But the question becomes this. If a, for a, who decided that a basketball has to be this large and inflated this much and bounced this high? Well, whoever invented the game of basketball decided that. People, committees get together and decide on the rules. Well, then, then you have to ask, well, who decided the church norm? Who decided that a church norm is three to five songs and a 28 to 40 minute sermon and an offering and an altar call? Maybe not an altar call. And I've seen churches where they're very large and they just won't do altar calls because maybe the pastor knows he has no oil for the people and he doesn't want to pray and see no results. And so he don't. What are we doing in our American churches where we can come week after week after week and experience no presence and experience no glory and experience no transformation? What have we done? We've bowed to the wrong Lord. Because whoever is... The answer to the question, who made the rules, the only person who can make rules is someone that has authority. Yeah. You didn't hear me. Yeah. The only person who can write rules and the rules are set is the person that's in authority. Meaning, if you're experiencing things, if you're walking in things that aren't biblically normal, you have bowed to another Lord. That's a law of life. Are y'all still here? I know some of you, it's Tuesday, some of you are tired. Are y'all getting this? Are you receiving this? I, um, I youth pastored for three years before I stepped out and jumped into this. I need that. Thank you, Lord. I youth pastored for three years in West Virginia. And I remember my, um, I was 19 when they put me in. Had not a clue what I was doing. Anybody else step out in the ministry one day and you had no idea what you were doing and just kind of a learn as you go. You get thrown to the wolves. And so 
This is one, is one of those things. I had the honor of youth pastoring at, my, at the Mullins Pentecostal Church for three years. Uh, I learned a lot about ministry in that time, and I learned a lot of things the hard way. Um, some of it was self-inflicted, you know. But one of my earliest ministry memories is I was, um, my, one of my earliest times doing uh, youth ministry, I was doing a series on sexual sin. Because I knew, I just graduated two years ago, and I, I knew that it was something that runs rampant in our young people, sexual sin. How many of you know that youthful, it's called youth, youthful lust? And these are things that attack young people. And I knew, because I was addicted to pornography for a number of years, and the Lord radically delivered me. And so I knew that it was something that young people struggled with. It's not something I, I heard by the Spirit. It was something I experienced and got delivered from. And so I wasn't preaching a series on sexual sin to come down harsh on people. I was preaching it because I was, I was preaching from a place of I was in this, and the Lord delivered me from it, so I know he can do it to you too. So I was preaching on sexual sin for three or four weeks, and I wasn't just talking about fornication. We were talking about that and pornography and, and other promiscuous things and even the, way, even the way you dress and the kind of spirits it attracts. Preach, I think I will. So I'm preaching on these things. I, I get a call from a parent. Nick, I heard about the series you're doing. Oh, great. Thank you, isn't it? You know, this is going to be really powerful for our young people. She said, you need to quit preaching that if you want, to, if you want your youth group to grow. I said, oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> I said, tell me more. And she said, Nick, it's normal. For kids to have sex and watch porn and drink alcohol. She, she didn't stop at sex. I'm going to give you the list. I never did forget this. Nick, it's normal for teenagers to do that stuff and watch porn. and ha it, It's normal for teenagers to have anxiety. Really? I didn't know that. It's normal for kids to be depressed. Really? It's normal for teenagers to commit suicide. This is a Christian parent. And so I said, that might be the cultural norm, but it's not the Christian norm. And so we had this, we had this discussion. And I just, I, and she also said this, it's normal for young people to experiment. Like in chemistry class? You know, like you make volcanoes out of the baking soda and the... Like, what do you mean it's normal for kids to experiment? They're, they're not experiments. They're sons and daughters. What do you mean they can experiment? Like, does anyone know it? I don't want you to say it out loud because that might mean a lot of things that I don't know what it means. I mean, I can tell you that, I, I mean, I was, I was in sin with pornography and other things, but I don't think I, don't think I ever experimented. That just sounds taboo. But in our culture, it's normal. And this parent who was claiming to be a believer, are y'all still here? Yeah. These are the things that even Christians say is normal. It's, well, if a teenager has anxiety, eh, well, that's normal. If a teenager is uh, being bullied and wants to, keep, wants to kill herself, oh, that's normal. Well, if a, if a young person wants to go to the party on the weekend and get drunk and arrested and, and you have to go pick your kid up for their first day, well, that's normal. Boys will be boys, you say. Well, I, I stand before you tonight and say this. Christians will be Christians. And if, if you claim to be submitted to Jesus, if you claim to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you will not accept cultural norms as a spiritual norm. You will not accept children being experiments. You won't accept them getting drunk and high. You won't accept it watching porn. You're going to want to do some praying and interceding. You're going to want to teach them about the norms of Scripture. I know there's a lot of young people in here tonight because you graduated, you're going into a new season. So let me just tell you this as you go from one season to the next. You're not an experiment. You're not somebody's toy. You're not something to be played with. You're a son. You're a daughter. You've been bought with blood. You've been redeemed. You've been filled with the Holy Ghost. It's time to walk like it and act like it and live like it. And It's time to bow to the real normal. Because these rules were written before America existed. 
These rules existed before the pagan idols did. These are the rules of life. I don't read anywhere where it says, go ahead and experiment. I heard, I heard parents say all my life, well, they'll grow into it. Once they graduate high school and get away from this bunch, they'll find their self going to church. No, they won't. Because you have settled for allowing them to walk in their mess. I'm, I'm going here. For you to say that it's normal for kids to grow up and get into all that junk and then get saved later is to totally overlook the fact that 11 of Jesus' 12 disciples were under 20. Oh, y'all don't want me to go there. Because that means you're going to have to repent for bound to norms in our culture. Did you not know that the only disciple over 20 was Peter? Nick, how do you know that? Well, Jesus collected tax from a fish's mouth. Who remembers this? He collected the coins out of the fish's mouth. It was a tax. If you read the story, he had enough to pay for Jesus and Peter, but he was with the 12 disciples. So why didn't he pay for all of them? Well, only people over 20 had to pay the tax. Jesus was 33. Peter, maybe not sure, but we know he had to be over 20 because he had to pay the tax. And we know the rest of them were teenagers because they didn't pay the tax. Can I tell you something? Where's, where are my under, under 20s in the room? There's a lot of you. Can I tell you something? There's no junior Holy Spirit. I'm going to say it again. There's no junior Holy Spirit. He wants to anoint you whether you're 8 or 80. He doesn't care. He just wants to anoint you right now. There were kings in the Old Testament at 8 years old. How much more will he give to you? Pearson's brothers are twins. They're 13. I met them when, they, are they 13 now, right? I, they, just, they just turned 13. I met them when they were 11. And they got baptized in the tank, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they joined my prayer team. Y'all have heard about them. I brought, they were here last July. And they still, like, they're praying for people in gas stations. Probably because Pearson taught them how. Because Pearson prays for people. In, you know, with Pearson, when I travel with Pearson and I have to get out of the car, I make him stay in the car. Nick, why would you hinder him from ministry? No, Nick's on a time schedule, and Pearson knows no time. <laughs> if we have to leave at 5 o'clock, for example, I tell Pearson we're leaving at 4. His shower prayer time is an hour. Am I, am I telling the truth? <laughs> He's going, yeah, yeah. I would say that's more biblically normal, however, than half of the church body in America. You provoke me to chase after biblical norms when you do that, so I'm not giving you grief. You, you provoke me to chase after the deep, and so do your brothers who are 13, and I'm going on 27, and they teach me to chase after the deep things of God. You're light years ahead of where I was at 17. They're ahead of where I was at 17, and they're 13. All right, anyway, um, <laughs> I've just heard my whole life that it's normal for young people to be addicted to porn and go drink and then go to church and pretend like they're holy. Yeah. And, 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 and you can't fault them for it because many parents have told them it's fine. I'm not, I'm not coming down harsh on you. I've, I've spent my whole life in church and then watched porn the other six days of the week. You're not talking to someone who's going to hide the stuff. Like I, I, under, I get it. But, and, and you might say God understands, but he also understands deliverance. Yeah. He also understands miracles. Hmm. So these are, our, these are our cultural norms now. Apparently it's in 2023, it's normal to commit suicide. It's normal to go shoot up uh, public schools and, and shopping malls. It's normal to have eating disorders. It's normal to transition your gender. It's normal to wake up and feel like you're a cat, so you're going to be a cat today. It's a spirit. There's a spirit in the land, church. And while you just sit and say it's normal, I say who wrote that rule? And if you've, and if you've accepted the rule, that means you've come into agreement with Satan. 
That's how real this is. That's how real this Compass Club is for me. I don't agree with what Satan's doing to the schools. And you might say, well, separation of church and, church and state. That does, not ex that does not exist in our Constitution. Did you know that? <laughs> I, I always thought that existed because the liberal... Uh, okay. I always thought it existed because the liberal establishment shoves it down your throat from fifth grade on. And then I found out when I got out of school and out from under the hand of the... It's not in the establishments of our United States. Of, it doesn't exist. And what, and, but it, was, it does exist in a speech. And what it means is that the government cannot inflict a religious affiliation onto you. It doesn't mean that you can't bring Jesus to them. Right. Well, enough of the cultural woes. Let's look in Scripture. In Scripture, every time. Somebody say every time. Every time. Somebody say every time. Every time, somebody shout every time. every time. Every time Jesus walked into a room, every time he walked into the city limits, yeah. healing was normal. Yeah. Deliverance was normal. Yeah. Salvation was normal. Ask the woman with the issue of blood. Ask blind Bartimaeus. Ask these people if it was normal for Jesus to heal. Even when Jesus went to his hometown, your Bible doesn't say he couldn't do anything it says he could only do a little bit because of unbelief. Even where there was unbelief, still a little bit happened that lets you know I am who I say I am. I'm preaching right now. Restoration was normal. Forgiveness was normal. Bitterness is not. You don't have to look at me. I'll still preach. I said unforgiveness and bitterness are not scripturally normal. You might say, well, I'm justified in my feelings. No, you're not. <laughs> like, no, you're not. Like, were you also justified of being saved? You must have been super righteous. I wasn't justified for deliverance. I was watching porn all day and then going to church on Sunday and pretending to be holy. But, but bitterness always feels justifiable to the person experiencing it. But when Jesus comes into the room, oh, no, no, really, when, when Jesus comes into the room, how big is that bitterness? It's not. When eternity stands, <laughs> when eternity stands in arm's reach, how big is that offense? How big is that person not saying hello to you? How big is Dr. B not shaking your hand? How big is that now? Yes, there are people who get offended when the pastor doesn't shake their hand, by the way. That exists. I don't know how it exists, but it exists. It's, it's, it's shameful to even be so easily triggered. Because if you can't keep up with the footman, how are you going to keep up when the horsemen start running? Well, I'll, I'll save that for another message. Have me back this fall. We'll go there. You still here? When Jesus walked into a room, signs and wonders were normal. When Jesus walked into a room, authoritative teaching was normal. They said he taught as a man with authority and not someone who just had persuasive words. Paul later said, I don't come to you with persuasive words, with a demonstration instead of power. Oh, are y'all still here? According to a great revivalist, the definition of revival is this, the acceleration and intensification of the Holy Spirit's Normal work. Well, what is the normal work of the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus said in the book of John that he comes to convict the whole world. When, when, are y'all with me? When Holy Spirit is in the room, conviction will happen. And not, not maybe. It, he said because he used the word will. He didn't say Holy Spirit might convict the world of sin. He said the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. So conviction is something that happens when the Holy Spirit is in a room. Not just in a church room, but also in your bedroom. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will enlighten you. Meaning he will give you revelation and teach you things to come. When Holy Spirit comes in the room, he will empower you with, the, with special abilities that were given to the believer. Find them in 1 Corinthians 12. There are nine gifts, and then in Galatians 5, the Holy Spirit also gives you nine fruits. Self-control, young people, is one of those fruits. Yeah. 
don't be upset with me. I didn't write that. Do you think I want that to be in there? Sometimes I just want to, you know, you ever went to post on Facebook and Holy Spirit goes, you're not posting that. I'm, I'm, I must be preaching to a bunch of saints. Because y'all are, just, y'all are just going, yeah. Like you know somebody. Yeah. Some of y'all are looking at your husbands. Husbands are looking at wives. This way. I'm not trying to start a marital problem. Anyway, when the Holy Spirit comes in the room, he also, he also calls people, not all people, but he does call people to a five-fold ministry office. The preacher, the teacher, the evangelist, the apostle, and the prophet. You could also say pastor instead of preacher, the man of covenant. I know Dr. B's taught on this. And so the Holy Spirit gives a five-fold ministry. It's interesting that when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, a dove came and rested upon him and stayed with him. That was the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting that an Arabian dove has, you ready, nine feathers on each wing. It's also very interesting that its tail has five feathers that guide it where it can go, and so too does the five-fold ministry office. That's great stuff there. God's a very, he's a very detailed God. He's in the details, you know? And so there's a five-fold ministry. There's nine fruits. There's nine gifts. Are you still here? That should be normal to us. Now, I want to I make this statement to you, and I mean, we can just say this based on Scripture. If you, uh, well, I don't want to be, I won't be careful. Anyway, um, Holy Spirit, if he's, if he's in your home, your family, your marriage, and your relationship with your children, if Holy Spirit is present with you and you're never convicted of sin, or if you say he's present with you and you're never convicted of sin, if you say he's present with you and he never speaks to you, y'all hearing me? If the things I just listed, which are, I'm the, I didn't make these up, these are, these are all in Scripture, mostly in the book of John, where Jesus teaches on the Holy Spirit. If those things aren't happening in your everyday life, he's probably not a part of your everyday life. You understand what I'm saying? If the Spirit of Jesus, like you, you will know the Spirit of, he said you'll know people by their fruit. If Jesus was a person, he also had fruit, and these are the fruits of his presence in a room. And so if, if, if these things, hear me, if you go to a church and these things aren't happening, find a new church. That's my favorite thing about this church is that I don't come, there's not one Tuesday I come here that young people aren't empowered. Like one day I came back from a stretch of revivals and all of a sudden you were singing. I baptized you last January, I think. And all of a sudden I come back and you're singing because you didn't stop at the water. Then you ended up doing, you ended up walking in purpose. I'm going to preach this anyhow. If, if you are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and you're not walking in purpose, like he, there's more for you than that. If he's not convicting you of sin, he's probably not. <laughs> how, do you, how do you know if he's with you or if he's not with you? If you can come to this church on a Tuesday night and you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit during worship and preaching an altar call, and then you go back home to the same stuff and there's no conviction, that probably means you came and experienced him here, and you won't, but you won't take him home with you. If you go to a church and these things aren't happening, that you should, pro- as I said, you should probably find another church because these are the attributes of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I want, I want my life and the church I attend, the covering I'm under, to be a place where the Holy Spirit habitates and he just dwells there. And Jan- I didn't realize the importance of this until January. And the Lord said it in, in the lodge over there. I'm on the third level of the lodge. And he said to me, he said, if you will make, if you will begin to cultivate worship in this house, this will be a place where you feel my presence every morning when you wake up. But it's, it's not a one-stop shop. It's cultivation. It's in the book of Psalms. He said, cultivate presence. It's a pro like you, like we, we, we want this generation, especially you want things so fast, bam, 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 bam. But gardening takes time. Seeds don't sprout overnight. You've got to cultivate these things. It pains me to see young people 
have such potential in the Lord. They come and respond to altar calls, and then they go back to the same. It's like a dog returning to its vomit. Don't you want to be free? I just And there are people like this in the room. I, I, I just sense it in my spirit. And I have to ask you, are you not tired of trying to spew bitter and clean water out of your fountain? Are you not miserable? Don't you want to be free and have peace? The most miserable thing is being in the presence of the Lord with sin. And it's miserable until you give it to him. I remember going to church addicted to pornography and pretending to be holy. Do you know it's harder to pretend than it is to actually live a real life that runs after Jesus? No, I'm I'm serious. It's harder to wear a... Did y'all have trouble wearing a mask during COVID everywhere you went? God, some of you wore a mask to the bathroom. I mean, you had to wear a mask everywhere. I still see people today driving their car by themselves. I look over at the traffic light and I'm like, what are we doing? Even the president, who's not sentient, knows that COVID's over. But we still have, but we still have. I'm sorry. Y'all want to, okay. I'm not used to preaching this close to the tank. And so they had to lay things down. And my biggest, my biggest fear all day has been pulling a President Biden and <laughs> tripping over this stuff. I mean, I've, I've, I've sat here during worship and just so carefully watched it and just, you know, how, how, how thick is that? Step very carefully. Because if I trip, it's going to embarrass me. Y'all know, some of y'all, I just need to tell y'all, it's okay to laugh in church. I don't know what church you go to, but it's okay to laugh in this one. Can y'all take a praise break for about 10 seconds right now? I say, I say all that to say this to you, that if Holy Spirit was present in your life, these things would happen at some level of consistency. Because if he's always present, he's always doing those things. And that doesn't mean you wake up convicted every single day. You just live a life of surrender, and when he convicts you of something, you give it to him, and then, then, then an overwhelming peace comes over you that the Bible says surpasses understanding. You know that Greek phrase, surpasses understanding? I, I'm, I'm also terrified. I have a fear of saying Greek words in, the, in this house. <laughs> Don't look at me. Um, the, the Greek phrase, surpasses all understanding, that I studied, uh, that, that at least this is what I read, is that what what that means is that peace will sit on top of your human logic and thinking and guard it. So when Paul said, I'll give you peace that surpasses all understanding, well, how can peace guard you if sin is already guarding your mind like stronghold forts? And when you exchange the two, peace will sit on top of you and guard you. Does anybody want peace to be your guard? Did you know that that's normal? In a a culture that's confusing and chaotic and nasty and divisive and and more political than spiritual, did you know that it's normal to walk in peace even when you leave this church? Did you know it's normal to walk in freedom even when you leave this church? Did you know it's normal to walk with anointing to your school, to your workplace, to your government building? Even in a culture like this, you can be a culture shock to a system that says, we've already bowed to our idols and we've already bowed to the rules of the game. And I just want to tell you that our culture thrives off of trying to tell you what normal is. I'm almost done. Can I go a little bit longer here? I got to camp on this. Our culture has to tell you what normal is because then you won't be able to come against it if they make it normal. Then you become abnormal. The reason people are canceled is because they don't check the box. I'm preaching right now. I really am. I, like, that's the reason that people are ostracized and bullied and intimidated. That's the reason Jezebel tries to come and sit on them is because they don't fit the normal box. 
But I want to I want you to know I'm trying very hard to fit a normal box because it's already been checked off for me. This is what normal looks like. It's normal to walk in power. It's normal to see deliverance. It's normal to see signs and wonders. It's normal to speak in new tongues. It's normal not just to see the demonic but to cast the demonic out. You have authority over the spirit of the age. If you know you have authority, I wish you'd shout right now. Turn to Romans 12. I'm going to close right here. He says this, Romans 12, first two verses. We all know these verses, but I want you to hear this. This blew my mind. When I looked up the definition of normal and it said conforming to a set of standards, Read Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Not just living, but living and holy. You can't just present anything to him. It's got to be living and holy. Are you still here? Which is your spiritual service of worship? And, somebody say and. Do not be conformed. Mm Mm-hmm to this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Meaning, you've gotta change the way you think about this stuff. Meaning, you can no longer just accept it as well, this is the way it is now. And that's what many of you have done to the movement, especially this, uh, the, the things that are being celebrated in our culture this particular month, you have just said, well, that's normal. That's the new normal. Well, it wasn't normal, say, 15 years ago. Now, that, that, those practices have always existed, sure. They've existed for thousands of years, you go all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah, but it, it was never normal. No, you didn't hear me. Our culture is trying to make sin normal so that you get to a point in it where you don't even know who you are. Because when you accept sin as normal, you forfeit your identity. Well... <laughs> The only way to become biblically normal is to be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Notice that scripture already cautions you not to be conformed. Well, conformed in Greek means this, to fashion oneself to. Meaning, if I'm going to be conformed to Dr. Cutshaw, that means I have to dress like him. I have to wear my hair like him. I have to talk like him. I have to preach like him. I have to have the same mannerisms as him. I have to marry a redhead like him. I'm okay with that one. But hear me. To be conformed to him means that I, somebody say I, I have to try as hard as I can to be just like something that I'm never going to be. Conforming is trying to emulate something that you'll never actually be. Like, I might, be, I might even become a good duplicate of Dr. B, but I'll, there's only one Dr. B. You might try to become a good duplicate of me or Perry or, or whoever, the person that you idolize. Often, people who conform have idols, and they're trying... Oh, my God. People who conform are trying to fashion themselves to an idol. Because you don't conform to Jesus, you're transformed into the image of Jesus. I'm, well, preach, I think I will. Conforming is solely based off human effort. So I would, have to try so, I would have to try so hard to be like him. And I would have to preach my messages like him. And I would have to have that same deep voice as him that I don't have. And I like to impersonate people. I mean, I guess I could try, you know. Aren't you so glad that you came to OCI tonight? Ramp OCI and cle- This is... The- This is the only church that has service on Tuesday, and we're glad that you're here. Somebody, and then, and then you know, sometimes. So, you know, and and. He said, stop while I'm ahead. 
Well, I can just move to another one. I think our church culture is doing a terrible job. We've got to quit bowing to the norms of our day. Let me just tell you, let me just tell you, if I'm president, these things will not be. Okay. <laughs> See, you can try to be someone all you want, but you'll never quite get it. You'll never quite match it. Even if, it's someone that's, even if it's someone that's holy and righteous, you'll never quite be that person. And when people who conform are often trying to impress people or be people that they're idolizing. And then there's transformed. Somebody say transformed. That Greek word means to totally change form and become another creature. So in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That for, literally means a, a different race of people that doesn't belong to the earth. It's a powerful statement. It's not poetic. It's powerful. It means a totally different breed of people who no longer belong to this. Amen. That's strong. Now watch this. To, to be transformed, it's the same word used in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We're transformed into the, into the same image from glory to glory. It's also used in Matthew 17.2 for the transfiguration of Jesus. So can I say this to you? I hope this is accurate, and he'll tell me if it's not. The same thing that happened to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration can happen to your mind. Is that fair? The same thing that happened to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration can happen to your mind. I don't think you have, sometimes you have to just have to stop and let it weigh in. That's a powerful statement. And how powerful would it be if it actually happened to you tonight? That your mind doesn't have to be anxious all the time. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to have an eating disorder. You don't have to struggle with suicide every day. It's a spirit that sits in your house and waits on you to come home. Now watch this. I'm almost done. Are y'all still here? I promise. I'm wrapping up right here. Have I gone too long for you? Whew. See, when you conform, it's all human effort. Conforming is trying to fit yourself and, and be this and be this and be this, and it's an endless journey. You'll never get there. And then you'll die not knowing Jesus while trying to become something you never, you never met. What a sad way to go. And that's, that's the way that many people, even Christians in America, are going today. And then there's transformed. See, conforming is all you. Transforming is all him. Yeah. Watch this. The only way to be transformed is to crucify the flesh. So what am I saying? You have to try to conform, but you have to die to transform. I'm watching light bulbs go off in the spirit right now. It's a, people, oh, wow. Young people, please, and all, well, all people, but especially young people who are in the trenches of this fight. Hear me. You don't have to conform and be like them. They will lead you into idolatry. But if you'll surrender right now. No, I'm serious. Young men, you don't have to be bound to pornography. Trust me. I know when conviction's coming into the room and it's, I'm, I'm waiting on it to hit peak conviction. That's when I quit usually. I know when conviction's coming because then people turn and start talking to their neighbor. <laughs> Why? Well, when, when something hurts physically, you take your mind off of it by looking at something or talking to someone while they fix the piece of your body that's hurting. You understand what I'm saying? Like if you have a cut, you look away. You don't, don't look at it while the doctor's doing something. Someone talks to you to take your mind off the pain because conviction hurts. That doesn't mean it's bad, but conviction hurts. And so when there's conviction in the room, I see, man, you, you haven't had to pee all night. But then conviction came in the room and it's like, oh, well, what a, what a great time for mom to call, you know, I got, or, or I got to go to the bathroom or I got to go do this or Conviction hits the room and they're like, NBA Finals tomorrow night, bro. Miami's going to get another one. They'll be up to it. You start talking about something that takes your mind off of the moment. And what you're doing in the Spirit is saying, Holy Spirit, leave me alone. Yeah, it was funny until you realized what you were doing. 
is saying, Holy Spirit, I don't want anything to do with that transformation. Pearson, come here. I want to give them an example of biblically normal. I told y'all you'd hear about him. Pearson is a... Uh, Pearson has changed my life, and he, he has said often that my, our ministry has changed his, but you've changed mine all the more. When I met Pearson, it was October of 2021. We had a revival, and it was supposed to go three nights and went six weeks. And was it night one? Or, yeah, yeah, night one. Night one, Pearson, who has lived his whole life in church, and his parents were in ministry, you know, he loves the Lord. And, and when he met me in our revival, he loved the Lord. But he had some things. Not only did he have some sin things, he also had some things from the enemy. And by that, I mean over a dozen doctor-diagnosed diseases. Not one, more like 14. Over, it was well over a dozen. I have a list of them. I read them at the prophetic summit. Actually, Perry made me read them to everybody. I can even pronounce some of the names of the things that I was reading to you. And, and it was so severe that the, the doctor looked at his mother and now, at the time, you were 16, 15. you were 15 when I met you, and they told him, they told, I'll let you, what did they, what are some of the things that they told your mom? Um, I met him in October, and in September, I had got my learner's permit, and they told my mom to go ahead and put the handicap pass on it, because I couldn't spend too much energy walking from the back of the parking lot to the store, and if I wanted to do something fun in the evening, I had to sleep all day. I couldn't go to school. Like if I wanted to go to a ball game or a party and spend a couple hours, I couldn't go to school. And um, by the time I was 17, she should expect around then for me to be in a wheelchair. So your body can only have a couple hours of energy a day. How many of you know that is not normal for the human body? No energy. Well, let me just tell you. <laughs> if you've ever seen him with me, let me just tell you something. He gets baptized. I didn't know him at the time he got baptized, but he gets baptized. He joins my prayer team. His family comes in, joins the prayer team. We've stayed tight ever since, and now I'm mentoring him, and I can't get him away from me. Pray for me, because here's what happened. When, when he got baptized, I don't know how it felt. You didn't really describe to me how it felt when you got baptized, but I do know that you never really prayed for healing. You didn't expect that, but you were asking for forgiveness for sin, and you were rededicating your heart to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so the presence of Jesus came on you because when you really surrender, his attributes also come, and his attributes are healing, miracle signs. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just repeating a prayer, but the real Jesus will touch you. And so yeah. tell them when the last time you took a pill for your medications were. The night before I got baptized. <laughs> this man stands before you today. He used to only have a couple hours of energy. He used to have to sleep all day to do two hours of activity. He used to need a handicap on his driver's license. And then he met Jesus. And then he got baptized. And then every single disease left his body. Pearson now runs my baptism ministry. And he'll be doing a lot of the baptisms in a minute. But I want to tell you about what really, he got healed of all the diseases, and that's wonderful. He, um, he's never been able to do anything physical. Now he's going to the gym with me every day. We were at the Y earlier. Doing, and because, he's, it's because he wasn't able to do it, now he wants to do it. That's a miracle. Now, we're in Huntington in February. I'm sitting at the desk in the hotel. He stays in the rooms with me. I'm, in, I'm at the desk studying, and I'm praying. I'm in the presence. I shut that, 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 you know, we're praying and studying and, and writing things down. Well, Pearson has a little speaker, a little JBL speaker, and he sits it on the table and just, we have worship music playing all day. He has it playing where the whole hotel can hear it, you know. And, see, and so we're, I'm in there studying, and I, I hear in the background, I hear the music, but I thought I also heard bed springs, and I, I was like, well, there's music playing, but then, I, then it became more prevalent. And I... And there he is. On the bed. And you said, Nick, that's kind of immature energy. No. He was praising the Lord, yeah. jumping on the bed. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, that's how he was giving the Lord praise. And, 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 and in these revival services, you'll see him running in the prophetic summit. 
I mean, this building's like half a mile wide. He's running, running, running. It's like a 40-yard dash you could run in here. And he's running, running, running. All, and Perry and Dr. B are going, who's that? What are they doing? It's the prophetic summit. That doesn't happen a lot here. It's a, and here, zoom, zoom, zoom. and there's so much energy, and he's everywhere, and he's jumping on the bed. Why? Because he couldn't do it before. But then, G, then he met Jesus. And what? It used to be normal to lay in bed all day. It used to be normal to have no energy. It used to be normal to not be able to eat. It used to be normal to expect a handicap pass. And at 17 years old, you, they told you to expect. Yeah. <laughs> what does the word will mean? To denote the inevitable? And they... And they said, that doctor looked at your mom and you and said, he will, did they say will? Be in a wheelchair by when? 17. When did you turn 17? March 16th. Come on, somebody. That's biblically normal. That's what it looks like to be normal in the presence of. Get on your feet right now all over the building. Come on, come on, come on. Just give him praise for about a minute. Lift your hands. Give him glory. Welcome him into the room. No, come on. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. With your, with your mouth. With your mouth. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you have a prayer language, go ahead. Go ahead. All over the building. All over the building. We're honoring Jesus. We're honoring Jesus. Just go ahead and get a soft pad playing for a little while. Some keys. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we honor your presence, and we want every attribute of your presence. We don't just want chill bumps. We don't just want conviction. Because you said we will have the power to lay hands on the sick. We'll have the power to cast out demons and there will be fruit. There will be results. There will be things that happen when we obey. Close your eyes all over the building. Holy Ghost. Just close your eyes. You don't have to look around. Just give honor to the people around you. But I really want you to, I know we're in a corporate gathering, but I want you just to take this time for you. And my question is this. Is there anything in your life that is not biblically normal that you think you've bowed to and you need to renounce? Are you, are you, have you settled with anxiety? Have you settled with depression? Have you settled with pornography? Have you settled with addictions to drugs or addictions to your phone and it's taken time from your family? It's taken time from the Lord. Have you, have you truly surrendered to his presence or are you just a, a church goer? Have you experienced the power of the Holy Ghost? Do you want to experience what biblically normal is? So with eyes closed all over the building, I'm not gonna call you out, I'm not gonna force you to take a step, but there is scriptural precedent for taking a step to receive something. It doesn't just fall in your lap. So if you're in the room right now with eyes closed and, and there's anything in your life that Jesus didn't give you, let me see your hand right now. One, two, three, all over the room. I said, anything in your life that Jesus did not give you, let me see your hand. It could be sickness, it could be addiction, it could be a stronghold, it could be bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, resentment. Anybody have church, uh, church hurt? Let me see your hand. Anything Jesus did not give you, let me see your hand. One, two, three. Nice and high, nice and high. My word to you is, number one, you don't have to live with that. Number two, it's time to surrender. And number three, his presence is here to deliver you. So if we, all of us, could just lift both hands right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We honor you right now. We honor you. You'll never, you'll never defeat it with your own efforts. You'll never defeat it with your own ideas. So if you're in the room right now, and you raised your hand for that altar call, no one's gonna pull you out, I'm not gonna make you come, but if you're ready to experience the real Jesus and you're ready to become biblically normal, how many of you would just say, all hands are up, but how many of you would just say, you know, I have, I have just said about the things going on in our culture that, well, that's just normal. How many of you have settled for the things of our culture? Would you just wave your hand at me if you, we need to repent of that. I don't mean for you to begin speaking curses. I mean for you to begin blessing these people. I mean for you to begin interceding for their salvation and not just settling for the enemy taking your territory. 
So if you've settled in that area, you need to respond to this. It's time to repent. On the count of three, if you raised your hand, you feel the conviction, I want you to come right now and just stand anywhere in this altar area. You don't have to get on your knees. Just stand. One, two, three. Take a step. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And when you find a place, just stand and hold your hands out before the Lord and close your eyes again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your power. If someone's nervous to come and maybe you don't feel like you need to respond, why don't you grab their hand and come with them? Lead them to Jesus. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Anxiety doesn't have to stay. Depression doesn't have to stay. Marital trouble doesn't have to stay. Come right now. Come right now. Thank you, Lord. When you get to the altar, I just want you to begin asking Jesus, would you come and meet this situation? Tell him. Tell him you're bitter. Tell him you're hurting. Tell him you're addicted. No one's listening to you. Talk to the Lord. Open your mouth and speak with him. Father, we thank you for your presence in this house. We thank you for your presence in this house. Tell him you need healing in your body. If you feel a hand on your back or, or maybe on, your, on the top of your head, there's a prayer team here that's wonderful and anointed, and they will be, they'll be coming around right now to lay hands on you and pray for you. And that's just a point of contact where they're joining with you because the Bible says we're any two or three bind together on something, it'll be established. So prayer team, go ahead and begin praying for these people and just allow the Lord to minister to you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Thank you for your presence. Father, we command every spirit right now that's not yours. I know that's general. Every spirit that's not yours, every depression, all the anxiety, all the addictions, every bondage, we command it to leave now by the authority of Jesus Christ. We command it to leave now by the authority of the Spirit of Jesus. We speak signs, wonders, and miracles into the room tonight. I pray for piercing level miracles, illnesses that were diagnosed and said, you will become this. Jesus, I, I ask right now that you would reverse the curse in Jesus' name. Reverse the curse over families. Reverse the curse over marriages. If your marriage has been having trouble, I'm not going to pray for you because I'm not married, but I know some married people in here that will. If you're having marital problems, Bring your spouse, even if your spouse isn't here, but if both of you are here, come right now. If there's been an enemy coming after your marriage, come right now. The enemy, you know, the enemy's attacking the family right now more than anything. Dr. B just preached on it. So if your marriage is having difficulty, come right now. I know we prayed for families last week, but I just feel the unction to do that. And I'll let Dr. B and some other people who, who are married pray with their authority and experience over that. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. not up here receiving prayer right now and you're not on the prayer team and you're just kind of spectating you can participate in this moment by simply extending your hands towards these people and I want you to begin praying freedom over them can you do that can we just participate as the family of God at OCI right now extend your hands towards these people and pray freedom and deliverance over them thank you Lord
there are a couple of you in the room that have been um, engaging in demonic things like the occult and the tarot cards and the Ouija boards. These things are open doors to the demonic in your home. If you've been engaging in those, I just ask you right now to repent and renounce those spirits and ask the Spirit of the Lord to come and close those doors. And when you get home tonight, you need to burn those things. You know, in the, in the book of Acts, when Paul was preaching, they brought all these witchcraft books and had a big bonfire with them. That happened, and I think it was Acts 19, all the witchcraft books, they came and burned them. And so, but right now in this moment, just renounce them. Renounce them. R repent for your engaging with them. And we command the door. We command the door to the demonic be closed in Jesus' name. We command the door to the demonic and to witchcraft be closed in Jesus' name.